All right, design in and for the real world. Um, I have a little confession to make in that I am not a US designer. I am a graphic designer of Soros. I graduated graphic design before computers were the world. And over the course of the 25, 27 years that I have been doing this profession, uh, digital has found its way, and computers and, and new media, as it was called by then, has found its way into my craft very, very fast. In 95, I designed one of Belgium's first e-commerce websites. That's where I'm originally from, Belgium. Uh, but I've been living and working in Asia all of this century, um, about half-half between China and Singapore. And so throughout my career, um, as a graphic designer, my role, my job has always said to have been making sense of what people do with media, what people do with communication, what people do with data, what people do with that button. So I design UX, I design experiences for people. Uh, I mentioned a button, but experiences might not just be part of buttons and screens and clicks and swipes. But it is important to understand what it actually is that we are asked to do. The question, what exactly is UX? What comes to your mind if I were to ask you that question? Anyone? Open floor. What exactly is UX to you? What comes to mind? Misha? Starbucks. Starbucks. I get what you're saying there. Anyone else? What comes to mind? How would you define UX? This is important. This is the thing you'll be doing. You'll be put in a position where you're asked, so what is it that you do? What is it that you're going to be doing for me? Explain to me why you are here doing UX. Here's my take on it. Any and all interactions over time between products, services, and people, that is what we design. Any and all. And that's the shortest way of, of describing the discipline UX, but then everything else is on that screen. Uh, you may hear terms like brand experience, service experience, product experience, yes, customer experience. It's all part of it. It stretches from things um, that cover strategy to defining the scope, what are we going to be doing and why, to structure how are we going to be doing this and why, to how is that organized, to how does that work. And now depending where you work, either everything is on the table or parts are on the table. And so I've worked at small agencies, I've worked at big agencies, I've worked at consultancies, I've worked at brands. And in various degrees, this is your end. I'm currently working at a consultancy, so the whole thing is on my table. We start with strategy, with insights, with determining why this brand, this client, has to do um, anything in experience, whether it's physical, whether it's digital, whether it's the combination of both. Problem finding is a key skill for us, not just problem solving. Quite often, what we uncover is that what a client thinks they need to solve is not what the actual problem is. So one key skill that you will uh, master as you exercise is the difference between a symptom and a problem. The problem is what you want to solve, the symptom is what leads you to a problem. Uh, our work will stretch from things that are very abstract, the thinking, the insights, all the way to what is very concrete, the object, the space, the screen, 
the thing you touch. But our challenge is that for the majority of our time, we do that for organizations that are not organized to deliver optimal experiences. And you're sometimes not even in a company designing UX where the optimal organization is present. Why do I say that? Well, most of the time we focus on the thing on the top, right? User journey design. The end to end of how a customer would navigate an interaction with a company. You're asked to do that. Very quickly you will realize that Companies are organized in vertical silos, departments, and functionalities. And the only way for you to deliver something optimal is if you go horizontal across the whole thing, for which a company is not organized. That makes a simple thing a very complex endeavor. A simple thing like, can I use your database to inform customer views for them, becomes very tricky and very difficult and a very long process to implement. But unless you do it, you're not going to be successful as a UX designer. So the difficulty is keeping everything that's below, that's invisible, on the radar, highly clear and visible for you to be able to do what's at the top, user journey design. If you succeed there, you, your team, your company, you're doing UX in the quote of real world. Big challenge. It's a big challenge because you're also at a time where UX is shifting. Uh, so as we would like to say, the future of UX is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Again, depending where you land, whether that's an agency that's, that has a media background, so they're very much looking into campaigning and optimizing digital touch points, whether that's a research company that wants to dig into why is this happening, what is the actual problem to solve. You'll be balancing between these two things, where the demand of an interaction is, can you make it usable and frictionless? Or can you make it in a way that is adding value to a journey? I don't want an interface unless it brings me value. You as a designer will be asked to just do it, but you as a designer should, in my opinion, be asked to facilitate the doing, facilitate the thinking, bring perspectives together, bring decisions to life. Journeys, most of the time our clients are asking, can you do me something from start to finish? and preferably before they purchase, and maybe something after they purchase. So end-to-end -end is, is sort of the price or the admission um, that you do in UX today. But what about the UX tomorrow? We have clients that are asking, can it be more than end-to-end? -end? Can it be enriching? Can it mean something in people's lives? Can I deliver my brand purpose through a journey that I maybe own, that maybe I own, or maybe I don't own. Because for brands, that is the shift that is also happening. The history of brands is that this is my product, and I want to be known for it. Starbucks came out, great call. But more and more, you see brands enabling things with platforms, with technology that they don't own, or they go into categories that they're not known for. Again, Starbucks, great example. It's one of the world's biggest banks. It holds the largest daily cash um, compared to any other bank. Why? Because of their loyalty card. The money you put on it is no longer your money. It's theirs. So they just became a bank. That's going to happen more and more and more. Um, because of competition and opportunities, Established brands are going to look to do something outside of their category. Telecom is going to look for things that are more than just providing you a phone or an internet connection. You're going to be asked, what is that for me? How does that look? How does that feel? Why should I do that? 
data, we cannot be speaking UX without mentioning the D word, data. Right now, we're all very skittish about that. We're giving you as little as possible data, but I want you to do as much as you can and even more with that. That contradiction, how you navigate that, is part of the remit of UX design. Uh, but that's going to change. Data is already, in my view, uh, ubiquitous. It's being captured all the time. So what are you going to do with that? It's your opportunity, again, to do something really purposeful because of how you use and think and apply the data. It's a big job, is what I'm, <laughs> what I'm getting at. There's a lot to do. do you, are you not required to do everything that I just mentioned? Well, hell no. Heck no. Can you pick one vertical? Sure. Can you pick a few? Absolutely. That's still also then the beauty of UX design. General specialists are as needed as single discipline experts. So to get to where UX can bring us, that big promise, um, it is important to wrap our heads around how do we do that. With that education, there's a great question that came um, for our previous speaker. Is what I learned in school applicable to how I'm going to work? Uh, the foundation of it? Yes, but you're the custodian. Because what your client, and maybe even your boss, wants to do is go from problem to solution in a straight line. Do a knee jerk reaction. Oh, competitor has a nap? I want a nap. They have a new feature, I want two new features. Knee-jerk reaction. Uh, what our job is, is to take a longer route, a curve. We go from what is factual, data, what do we notice, what, what is an actual uh, proven piece of evidence. We bring that into the abstract, so what do they mean? What are themes, what are patterns, what, what can we generalize on? which informs conceptually ideas, opportunities, thinking, from which we decide what are we going to deliver. And that becomes the solution. And then the whole thing starts all over again. Here's another bonus for being in UX design. Your job is never done. It's never done. Once you got there, that solution, that's your design brief next week. Because every time you put something out there, things will happen that no one ever saw, that data never informed, that we could not have imagined, maybe not even foreseen. And now we need to do an intervention or an elevation of something or eliminate something. And then that starts over again. Our job is never done. But to genuinely do our job, it would be, and I'm hesitating to use that word, it would be a mistake slash limitation to approach this only from the user perspective. Great, I see a lot of nodding heads. Typically when I say this, when I, say this I get um, a few frowns. Like, what the hell, I'm at a UX talk. The topic is user centricity, and this guy is telling me, no, 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 that's not enough, uh, don't do that. Well, consider this. Um, very famous quote by Henry Ford. If I had asked what people wanted, I would have given them faster horses. Steve Jobs, I'm not asking what people want, they don't know what they want. Right? There's something there. Consider that we did not come up with electric light bulbs by iterating candles. It requires something else. It requires a vision. So, when you open up to the possibility that your job is a balance between what users want, but what a brand should stand for, that sweet spot, that's where you are. 
that's what you want to defend or bring into conversations, or that's where your thinking should be. Why? Because you act as a business. You're doing it for businesses. They may not necessarily want to solve that user problem, and they won't do it if there's nothing in it for them. And nothing in it for them, eight times out of 10, means money. If it costs more for the return that it brings, they're not going to do it. And you might be really empathetic with that problem that research has surfaced. It's still a business decision. So if it doesn't fit the vision, if it doesn't fit the business, they're not going to do it. How do you manage this? Well, the beauty of it is there is no tr one truth between being uh, brand-centric, vision-centric, and user-centric. It's equally true. It's two equal truths. And that is called a polarity. What you need to do with a polarity is understand when you are over-focusing on one so that the other is not happy. Polarities are very easy to explain. We do a polarity without even thinking about it all day, whether we're awake or whether we're sleeping. Breathing in and breathing out is a polarity. You cannot pick one, you have to do both. Breathing in is good for you. Shall we all breathe in? Because it's good for us. Let's take a deep breath in. Breathe in. Breathe in. Breathe in. Keep breathing. It's good for you. What happens? It's painful, right? We have too much carbon dioxide in our bodies. We have to do something else. It's no longer in our interest. We have to exhale. But can you keep doing that? Also not a good idea. So UX is the practice of breathing in and breathing out with your brand and vision. It's sitting down with companies and understanding if I focus too much on vision, I lose relevancy with my audience, what are the signs for that? When we see the signs, we need to do a UX intervention. But when we do too much UX, there is no, there is possibly no engagement because we're just doing what people say they do. We don't stand for anything anymore. What are the signs for that? Do an intervention. That's the job. That's the big picture of the job. Big demand. So how do you survive that? How do you get in this industry and survive? Um, I've been around for a few years. One of my biggest frustrations is seeing talent leave the industry because they can't take it, they can't survive. And one of my goals as a senior now is when I identify the right talent, can I keep them in the industry? And a lot has to do with, with getting your mindset in a white right space. You do that, you can survive the big jump between entry level, midweight, senior, and then that gap to leadership and directors and all of the above, because it's typically at sort of midway senior that you're starting to have doubts. This is not what I thought it was going to be. This is not fun anymore. I don't know what to do. I feel like an imposter. It's overwhelming me. Nothing I do seems to matter. I'm out of here. And so we get a surplus of yoga instructors and we get a shortage of UX designers for senior practitioners. So what can I advise you to do about that so I can keep you in this industry? Well, we touched on it earlier, how you learn UX is not how you're going to apply it. Um, the number of times I would go to a board or, or, or business owners or CEOs and I give them my three month project uh, the plan for it, I work hard on it, I need a month to go research, a month to go design, and then a couple of weeks to build it. And they'll go, great, I love it, can you do it in a month? 
because that's what matters for them. And then what do you do? Say no, lose a project, say yes, panic. Um, this is how you typically do your work. Right? Now, if I need to crunch this in a month, what do I sacrifice? Um, what do I compromise? Where do I shortcut? And what are the consequences for that? The biggest thing that you can do here is give clarity around what are we trading off. We're going to do it in a month, I'll do it in a month. I cannot do qualitative interviews because that takes a month to organize. So what are you losing? The voice of the customer. Are you taking a risk, Mr. Client? Can you live with that risk? Yes, your decision, moving on. Now, as a practitioner that could uh, thing up, that doesn't make us happy because we know we're compromising the craft. It's a business decision. It's not you. It's not you who failed as a designer. It's a business decision. It's very difficult to fail as a designer that way if you start seeing it from that perspective. Because you're not designing you, you're not designing for you, you're designing for a business. Business says B, your recommendation was A, they accept that there might be risk in it, job done. Uh, once um, we found with a client, uh, because I gave him a very strong recommendation to do what I felt the evidence was telling me, and they went on a different path and they failed. And now they had to come back to me and asking me that failure, can you iterate it to what you say, said you we had to do? And so I had my team wear t-shirts that said on the front, if at first you don't succeed, and on the back, do it the way I told you. Now, I could do that with this client because we have that kind of relationship. This is not a pro tip. Don't go doing that unless you have a good relationship with your client. Your first challenge going into this industry is making sure you know what it takes to do good work. You become entry level or beginner and midweight by knowing what is bad work and what is good work. You become a senior and a leader by knowing what is good work that is the right work to do. The right work to do, that is a strategic business decision. More so than it is um, a qualitative insight informed decision. Ideally, it's both. Not always. And not always. If you can evidence what makes it not just good work, but the right work, you are the senior. You understand how businesses work, how they should make their decisions, and where the evidence is in your work and in your thinking that would make them acceptable. So that's your learning curve. Understand what makes work good, and then understand what makes it you do not want to be playing in the bottom right corner. Careers die there. Clients get lost there. Upper right, that's your comfort spot. And accepting that anything works. Small jobs, big jobs, medium-sized jobs, they're all difficult before you. We all start our projects with a fairly good idea of what we're going to be doing, and then in a week or less, you have no idea where to work, where to start. You get reports you don't understand. You work in a category or an industry you have no affinity for. And yet, it is your role to bring clarity and inform decisions. Um, again, for me personally, I love that. Um, I like to know a lot of things and we kind of show that I'm also clever. So I'm in the right profession because I get all kinds of different challenges to solve, whether they're in healthcare, in finance, or nonprofits, in transportation, in telecom, in consumer goods. I can go on and on. 
So there's never a boring day, but there's never an easy day. And once you do this, once you do this job design, you'll fairly quickly come to understand that the actual work is this. Doing design is basically managing conflicts. The actual artifact that you make, the actual product or screen or space or whatnot, the thing you make is the easiest part of the entire process. But before you get there, oh boy, before you get there, all the hard work needs to happen. And typically all the hard, hard work is aligning uh, thoughts, is, is, is getting a shared understanding, is informing a decision, is having everyone say, okay, let's do it. Pro tip, if there's a great enthusiasm and people just go, yeah, let's do it, I'd be worried. If you meet resistance, you bring something new. You bring something that people need to consider and think about. You have their attention. So don't always see rejection or resistance as a bad thing. In other words, don't reflect it on what you did. It's what they are processing. It is a good sign, trust me. Them going, oh, that's fine. Carry on. I'd be worried. They're not invested. And another pro tip, and I know that some of you might think, well, that's not me, because I am not a visual designer, uh, but practice thinking visually. So those graphs you see on the slide, do that. You'd be amazed how much time you save and how quickly that shared understanding happens because you visualize it in, in a drawing, in an infograph. Meetings can be cut by half by doing this. So um, if you were to open my bag when I go to work, I got whiteboard markers in it. I'm ready. I'm ready to visualize. Um, even at consultancies, we have noticed the difference between having a meeting with a camera on a whiteboard and sketching what you hear or just talking. So practice that. You don't have to be a really good drawer. You have to collectively kind of capture what is being said and have everyone in that room or space agree that that's what they see in the job done. You're not running the boards with your scribbles, so don't worry about that. <laughs> but you will get understanding. You will get people feeling like this is what we talked about, and that is how. If that thinking is made visual and your client walks away and they can explain it internally to people who are not in the room, you won. You did your job. So that's powerful. And then, last slide, I believe. No, one more. Um, who do you need to be? That was a question that came up as well. How, well, what are the characteristics of a really good UX designer? So in my point of view, when I interview people, I look for this. Competence, sure, I need to understand how much support do I need to give you or get for you when you work here. Now, can I drop something on your desk and they'd be fine? Or do I need to sit down next to you? Right? It's important because I need to then, uh, I need to manage my own time, right? Uh, character. Are you the person that is able to take a punch? I'll just put it out there. Right. Do you, um, when conflict is being managed in those design discussions, do you crumble? Or do you have a point of view and um, not an opinion? We all have opinions. A point of view and a belief in your own abilities that don't make you crap in your stress. Because trust me, the job is trusted. So how do you handle stress? Do you then take that out on other colleagues next to you, or do you beat yourself up over it? Not a good habit. Not a good habit. Curiosity. 
Uh, if, if I pick one trade out of these three, it's curiosity. Curiosity to do the thing you've always been doing, day in, day out, with a new set of eyes, with fresh thinking. Or you want to not. I've done a few. But can you approach that with curiosity? Oh, yet another brief from this category that I've always been getting. Can you do it with curiosity? Well, I think I know what the problem is. Can you do it with curiosity? Because again, what you think the problem is is probably a symptom of the actual problem. And how do you get better at it? Just get out there and go do it. Go do it, go do it again. Try, try again. Try a little different. And before long, you have enough of a reputation, you have enough of a skill set to have a bit of an autopilot going on. And to have bandwidth to start doing new things or think broader. Um, there's, really, there's really no other way. Um, in some companies, this, this could be easier than in other companies. Uh, there are agencies that uh, will give you a chance, even if you have no portfolio, but you have the right mindset and the right curiosity. But there might be other agencies that will not consider you, not even your entry level. I have to confess, in the, the company I'm at, entry level is either you're an intern, and, and we forgive you for not knowing anything, or you're an analyst, and you have a few years of experience under your belt. And uh, my company has to do that because of the type of projects that we have, the scale at which we work, the speed at which we work. Um, we need people to hit the ground running, as it's called. So if you're looking for roles, then also try to understand, and you could also do that through LinkedIn searches, who's in that UX team that I'm applying for, what are sort of the levels that are there, what are their histories, their first time UXers, this feels like a good place to start. Um, that's, a, that's, that's a way that you can approach it. Um, but having, Having said all that, UX is not just screens, it's not just apps and websites. Experience design is so much more broader. Also, I have to think, even if you're new to this, to this industry, what have you done previously that translates to this industry? We in our team have people that study psychology, is like a natural transition into research, maybe, because our research needs to make business sense, not just human sense. We have people who are architects, or used to be architects, interior decorators even, um, graphic designers, we're communication specialists, UX has a lot of communication requirements in it. We have accountants, uh, we have lawyers, the key is, what is in your past experience that translates, that's transferable to this industry and the challenges that we do? If you can clarify that in interviews, you're helping the person that's hiring you because that's on their mind. This person that I'm interviewing now, how do they fit in here? What can they do? What can they bring that someone else might not? And again here too, if you interview with agencies uh, or consultancies, we're servicing all categories. So the experience you have in a category might actually be, you know, that ace up your sleeve that you didn't think you had. So that's what I wanted to share in terms of mindset. If you want to go a bit deeper, I'm going to shamelessly self-promote myself here. Um, I wrote an entire book on this. How to design with meaning, how to design and not lose your soul. How to think around things like collaboration, when is that occurring? 
Uh, spoiler alert, a lot less than you think it does. Collaboration is not delegation. Uh, you doing what I ask you to do, and we're not collaborating. <laughs> um, what is innovation? What is invention? What I hope to do with this book is give enough methodology, enough structure and language to make distinctions. Um, another pro tip that I'll give you um, in, in our job is the ability to make distinctions. Anyone who's worked with me knows that I am a rather peculiar one. <laughs> I insist on picking the right word. Now, it's probably information architecture that rubbed off on me, right? But picking the right word to create a shared understanding or an informed decision is so key. Um, it's a fun warm-up exercise. The next time you do a, uh, a workshop, you ask people, draw me a house. And you draw a character, uh, the TV character house, just to quickly demonstrate how a word is open for any kind of understanding unless you know what we know what it is. Do that 50%, 60% of your job is done. And with this, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Harry. We will have a 10 minute uh, session for you to answer some questions. Of course. You can send in your, your questions in here, unless anyone would like to answer. I, I can hand over the mic. I have two questions. Anyone? Shall I take a seat? Yes. <laughs> anyone with questions? Oh. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm in Brad. Um, I'd like to refer back to your slide with the affinity. Diagram. The polarity diagram, yes. Yeah. I saw that the bottom one is gap, relevancy gap and engagement gap. Yes. What would be the top one? If it's gap. There, there will be a gap. Um, the top ones are the positive signs of you being vision led and or user centric. So ideally your signs stay above uh, or in the upper part. It's when you over-focus on only doing brand that you risk not being relevant for your user because they don't understand what it is that you want. Yeah. Um, someone who did it really well, and I know, around a UX conference, and it feels an obligation to bring him up, but someone who did that really well was Steve Jobs. When he put the iPod in our pocket, he already knew what his end but it was too big a gap to come out with an iPhone. We would have just simply not understood why would we spend a thousand plus dollars on that. So let's start with something low risk, digital music. If that doesn't really work, what have you lost? Nothing. It's digital music, you can go and get it again, it lives in the cloud. But once you understood, it sits on, on devices, share it, I can manage it. Well, now I can do it with your money and with your, with your health data. That vision he already had, but scaling towards that, then you translate how to bring user centricity into your vision. Another, another example that we tend to use quite a bit is Netflix. Uh, Netflix started renting out they still have, I believe, a DVD store, right? The only difference they had was you had no late fee, so you could keep the DVD as long as you wanted. Uh, and that's how they got their audiences. But they didn't go into business wanting to do that. They understood that technology at one point would enable streaming. What do they need to get really good at first? Subscription management. And as such, they balance user centricity with their vision. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Another question is, since you mentioned architects and uh, psychologists, 
What values do you think a background in architecture or other careers, careers like psychology brings to UI UX design? Apart from uh, a certain way of uh, viewing the world, uh, and that's important to me, um, so I understand how people see and think and, and interpret data that I might interpret differently, so that collectively uh, we form that understanding. I found that architects have a natural affinity for experience because they craft spaces with that in mind. Um, so someone doing this room has thought about every single thing in there, how the light will change over the day, uh, over the time of the day, um, what kind of flooring needs to go in, how to sound. All of that. Um, and I find that, or at least it's been my experience, that those kind of people translate that really well, even to digital um, uh, or shopping journeys. A uh, psychologist is always, there's a lot of psychologists in user research. And I think that has to do with that, that drive of trying to understand human behavior. Right? What makes you spend that much money on something you can get for a lot less over there. Um, uh, why are you only shopping on that platform when that platform also exists? And, and trying to understand human behavior is rich territory for UX um, because then we understand what are sort of triggers or another fancy word, semiotics, that we, uh, have people make one decision over another and we can influence that. Um, so there's one way to see our craft, is we're in the craft of influencing um, and trying to, I almost have take advantage, that would be dark pattern then, but trying to make use of user behavior or, or, yeah, or change it. This is a good one, I'm really uh, curious as well. How do you usually persuade business stakeholders who do not see the purpose of UX and align their interests with the UX team? <laughs> Well, that's only my day today. Um, <laughs> some of the slides you, should, you saw today is, is, uh, is uh, these are on hand. Um, we need to investigate why is it that they don't see what you see? What is it that you don't know that they know? Um, because in all honesty, they might be onto something. I've been proven wrong just as much as I've been proven right as well. Um, so that's first. If they have no data to show, then you're working with an opinion. Don't fight that with your opinion. Mm. Then the strongest man wins, and they're the client, so that answer is already no. Um, root your thinking into the evidence. What evidence do you have to show me that your client does exactly what you say they will do? No. How risky is it when you go wrong? Another great exercise to do in workshops. We've made assumptions on what will work. How big is the risk if these assumptions are wrong? Um, I've, I've done work for MOE where we were looking at bringing education online. And one of the assumptions I threw back at them was we're all assuming students have access to a computer. What's the risk if we're wrong? Children left behind. Families in poverty. Shared computers that, that don't have the capacity. And so that catches a client. That, that's, the, that's the fear factor of your client. And that making the wrong decision. And that is your, your goal. Bringing them to the right informed decision. But making that about data, not opinions. Very right. I guess it's all. it also depends on your negotiation power and trying to understand where people are coming from as well. My job is shifting conversations. Mm -hmm. the, it, Best way of putting it. it. It's the hardest part of the job. Um, Agreed. Once we get to, this, to design decisions, it, it takes off. Um, it's, it's, it tends to be the easier part of the process, but getting to decisions. 
Okay, next question would be something more deep. When do you draw the line between compromising on good to live another day and moving on to fight a more hopefully meaningful work? Like just going through the motions versus... Oh, okay, 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 got it. Um, it's my personal view, so take that for what, what it's worth. I feel that if you're in a space where you're appreciated, in a space where you're learning and you can get your curiosity satisfied, and the pay is what you need you know, to, to be in a comfortable space, then you have no reason to change. If any of these three or more than one is compromised, leave. Look for look for the answer. If you're not learning, you are not just standing still, you're falling behind. The world is moving way too damn fast. The pace at which change is happening, if you are not in a place where you're learning, you're not standing still, you're falling behind. So don't do that. Um, don't do it in places where they just have no affinity for you or you don't feel appreciated. The job is hard enough. Uh, you should have some recognition. You should feel that you're part of the dialogue. If, if not, not a good sign. And then obviously, don't do it for free. <laughs> don't do it for free. Don't give it away. Um, feel like they're paying you for your Um, yeah, if that's not happening, then you're also on the market to be touched. There are there are brands, there are agencies out there who throw a lot of money at this discipline. Obviously, with all the expectations that come with it. Um, but yeah, fair game. All right, last two questions. How do you stand out in a competitive uh, UX market now that you're also in the hiring position? How, how, what's your advice for anyone who wants to stand out? First, decide who you are in the U.S. Right? Um, there's a lot of disciplines. Are you the specialist in one or two or all? Um, so don't, don't apply for a job that you don't want to do in the U.S. Don't uh, apply for jobs thinking this is my way. I've never seen that work. I've had people apply to me that, that go, hey, you're looking for a PM, um, but I have a portfolio. Don't do that. Um, because there's no role for anyone needing a portfolio. Otherwise, that would have been a position to which you could apply. Um, how do you set yourself apart? If you're interviewing with me, again, I want to know what you bring to the table other than your portfolio. Um, what was your role in the work that you did? And help me understand the decisions that were made. Because this is what we're going to be doing every day. Um, and, and so if you can't answer me that in an interview, I'm highly, I probably won't remember you. Sorry, you probably will not stand out. Um, but again, that character, if I'm asking pointed questions, are we, are we having a conversation? Right? Um, that's what I've been looking for. I guess the slide where you said what the three important things would be curiosity, yes. character, yes. and competency. Competence. That's exactly, in a nutshell, is what hiring managers and seniors like you will be looking out for UX uh, uh, people in the UX industry. Because two of these are elements of trust. If you are competent, I can trust you. Mm -hmm. If you have the right character, I can trust you. Mm -hmm. Trust is what we sell to our clients, mm -hmm. not just UX, not just buttons or screens. We sell trust. Um, and trust is, it, among other things, is based on do I believe you have the competency to say what you do mm. or, or to do what you say you can do? Yeah. Um, and character is do you back it up? If I'm not, if not, if no one's keeping an eye on you, do you back it up? Mm. Right? Um, and that's important. 
lastly, before I, I uh, we let you go, you will get a chance to speak with Mario later, probably on your own. But lastly, I just want to know, what advice would you give your younger self? What career advice? <laughs> oh, don't take yourself so damn serious. Uh, take the work serious, but not yourself. Um, you are not your work. The work does not determine who you are. Um, if you do good work, it does not mean you are a good designer. Conversely, if the work was not well received and it's considered bad, it does not make you a bad designer. If you design for other people, there are decisions made that you may or may not agree with. I've delivered work based on decisions that I do not agree with and that did better than I feared for my clients. Just as much as the other way around. But if you're able, and it's hard, right? don't, I'm saying this as if it's uh, so easy to do. I still get tricky. <laughs> but if you're able to detach your own self worth from what it is that you've put out as work, it's, it's freedom. I, I can't recommend it strong enough. You're not your work. Your work does not determine your value, only you determine your value. Thank you so much, Mario. Let's give Mario a round of applause. Very excited to have you.